Okay, I'd like to uh, reconvene the CHAP. And as a first order of business, um, I think we need to uh, discuss uh, our calendars and when we're going to have uh, the next chat meeting. So, Mike, could you uh, take over on that? I don't know about you, Byrne, but my schedule for the fall, I'm going to be teaching, but I'm, I'm pretty flexible. What, is that the same for you? I'm, I'm pretty flexible, too. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I shouldn't be a limiting factor in when right. I have this. So what we need to do is talk to the other members of the committee and see if there are specific dates that they cannot meet. I think we're talking about probably October, November. Late November would be all right with me. Does that mean the fourth week or in November? Or is the third week okay? Um, fourth week would be better. Well, remember. Yeah, the 15th work would work. The week of the 15th, no. I could, I could do the week starting with 22nd of November. All right. U.S. holiday. Travel, it's a bad time to travel. Travel, yeah. One of the busiest days. How about the next week? Yeah, possible. Holger? That's right. Outlook just broke down just oh, a second. Okay. <laughs> oh, you can make it yourself, even. Yeah, very good. Olga, look at Russ. <laughs> <laughs> the first week in, uh, well, the 29th. 29th, 30th, and December 1st time frame. Chris? Works for me. I, I've got somebody scheduled for a seminar that Friday that I've invited, but. And that could be rescheduled. But Front end of the week is okay. Yeah. Russ, how's that for you?
the week of the sixth is out for me, but uh, I could do one, two, three, first, second, third, no problem. Yeah. Hoger? Yes. Okay. So uh, the next decision is do we want to schedule a two day or three day meeting? Thoughts? Over. Do we plan to invite other guests? Have we talked about that? We have not talked about that yet. So. I think it would be good to renew the invitation to Tom Berg. But other than that, I think, I don't think we, um, I don't think there's a need to invite anyone else at this stage. I would like to invite somebody who might help us to interpret the enhanced data. Because the deeper I get into enhanced data and extrapolating from the biomonitoring data to the dose, the problem is that uh, enhanced data is generated after fasting. So I would have like to have somebody who can model out the fasting period and what does it mean in terms of exposure because we know many of the phthalates are mainly foodborne and if you have a fasting period of 12 14 hours that's a major influence of has a major influence on, on the metabolite excretion and then of course in back calculating to the dose chris do you think you can handle that because that has to do something with, with kinetics and because I think this is going to be a major point, uh, those calculation. Have anyone in mind? Not yet, but it's open for discussion. I mean, I'm, I'm sure uh, Antonia would be willing to come up. Um, but you know her; she does the analytical part. The other things, um, I'm not sure she's the right person, but she might know who is. Uh, I read some publications from I think it's Rick Stalhart. Uh -huh. He did some calculations based on uh, including the fasting period. Rick Stalhart. For the modeling, yeah, he's more of a statistician. Yeah. When is the date? The question of whether it's a two-day meeting or other than that, and that question of what the agenda is. We've got to nail one of those down before we get more things on the table. Okay. I would suggest we have a two-day meeting and. Explore the agenda, and then if it needs, if it can be one, fine. If it needs to be three, fine. But let's start as a default for a two-day meeting. Okay. Mike, where did you arrive in terms of dates? Okay. Had uh, the options of November, somewhere between November 29th okay. and December 3rd with yeah. the I think flying the, cave, the caveat that the 29th is not uh, a good day or the 28th is not a good travel day yeah. I think was it the Tuesday was the 30th so we, we need to think about the first as being the first day of uh, the first is the first day of Hanukkah which is it's not a religious holiday but just uh, Young children, just for me. That would. I mean, I, I, I could come if I needed to. But. Why, why don't we say uh, second and third then? Okay. But that means flying on the first. Okay. Okay. I guess the Hanukkah starts on the evening of yes. the first. Yes. 
Does this mean chaos for us international travellers? Or are we the second to third? Mm -hmm. While we're together with calendars, should we explore an alternate to that in case we need one? Do that. We're getting closer to the end of the year, which is not a good time. Thirteenth would be possible as a fallback, but I would prefer the date we agreed on first. That would be the first choice, but I'm just looking for a backup in case we need it. Sure. Week week of the thirteenth. Thirteenth, fourteenth would be as a fallback. Yeah. Thirteen, fourteen. Wide open. That 13th and 14th is not going to work for everyone. No, I think that going the next week we're getting too close to the yeah. holiday. Yeah. So let's go into January. Yeah, Andreas is not available. Okay. January is pretty open for me, except for the 24th and 25th, another Veterans Age in Orange in California. So, the, so the that week? week wouldn't be good for me, the 24th. How about the week of the 10th? Fine. Um, Not good to me. 15th, then. It's fine with me. When's MLK? Okay, because we wouldn't have the building. 18th, Holger, Chris, us, okay, January 18th, 19th, it's alternate. 19, yeah, oh, well, I think that's the, it's the 17th, I think, yeah. so. Holger, January, are, are you going to go to that? Yeah. Uh, I don't. Well, I didn't know that they had set a date. Okay, that's good. It, it's SVOCs, um, so it includes phthalates and also flame retardants and other volatile compounds that you find in house dust and window film so it may be informative okay so we've got um, dates December 2 through 3 as a primary and January 18th and 19th as a as an alternative if December dates don't work okay <clears throat> and then Mike you're going to uh, 
work with the EPA in terms of their fall workshop on. Yeah, and now uh, it, it was January 18 to 19th as the backup? Yes. Okay. I will coordinate with EPA listening so our possible dates and we do want to invite back uh, Tom Burke possibly <clears throat> for another agenda item information that we didn't get yesterday <clears throat> since we continue to, to struggle with this question of where does it come from in food mm -hmm. and we didn't have the food center with us yesterday right. it would seem as though we should either ask, maybe first choice is to ask them to provide a written summary table for us that would be easily understood about what the levels are and what FDA assumes is the source of Phthalates in those foods where it's measurable. Second choice would be to have somebody come and talk to us next time. If they could get those data to us now, it would be helpful to us to think through what we want rather than respond to it for the first time in December. I think you know the answer is that what they if they have data, it's probably not very recent. would be helpful to know also what are their plans for gathering more data You're right and also there was a question raised the offer was raised yesterday whether we want to know anything more specific about drugs right and by by class by agent composition by phthalate by age of patient and that was mostly for diethyl phthalate dibutyl too yeah, well, I, I, uh, most of well, their data are, are diethyl. I mean, I think they said they have one. Last dibutyl. And then the, the supplements and nutraceuticals. I mean, that's that's a different uh, part of the FDA, I guess, or uh, different part of the government. But do, is there any reason why it would be because of the compounding of the pill? I think Holger, you you have German data, right? On um, I I could provide for the next meeting the data from Germany, in which medications, dibutyl and diethyl phthalate are. Um, I don't have any data on the food supplements, but possibly it's possible that uh, they are used there too. So I think we should really pinpoint it to prescription drugs, over-the-counter drugs, and food supplements. And in the light of the fact that the data from Enhanes is from the years 2003 and 2004, I would be interested in the late containing pills at that time too, because we might need this information for interpreting the data. Because there are a couple of publications linking high dibutyl phthalate exposures to the use of medication. Yeah, and we, we had published on using the NHANES data, using the urinary levels and the um, self-report of medication use. And it was, um, must I think it was 2003, 2004, yeah. In, in Haynes, it was two to three, or I'll, I'll check. But from the fourth report, is two three to two two o four. That's okay. the three to four, but I'll, but I'll check. Dates. And are we ready to tell Abby and uh, uh, Stephen exactly how, what form we want the data 
like age groups or whatever, or do we want to, we could continue to uh, think about that. Was it the sense from the rest of you that what they had to do was generate these data? Or is it I, a matter I, of what they send us? No, I think it's a database, and they could summarize it in any different ways. Okay. So. To be honest, I had a look into this database, some of the data. It didn't help me much, but... Uh, Yeah, I, but, uh, I think they have um, more inform they may have more information than is in the public database, and so they could, you know, class things by type of drug or something like that. I think that's the... Um, I think that's the difference. I think without seeing something of what they have it's hard to know what to ask for at least from my perspective so yeah. i mean i could take a take a stab at you know if we ask them to stratify it by age and by uh gender or something like that yeah just so we get to see what they have yeah Are we assuming that they might give us uh, urine data as well as blood data? Now you, we're talking about NHANES. Oh, the uh, the, the FDA, uh, yeah, or, or or the drugs. Drugs. We're talking about what's in the formulation. Oh, so it's just exposure. That's, that's right, right. Surrogate yes. for exposure. It yeah. would be the sort of scenario-based exposure. And Haynes, we're talking about it's it's essentially, I think it's all um, urine. Yeah. And I'm not well. Anyway, I'm not sure. I don't know for certain that FDA can c go back to 2003, but they probably can. Age, gender. And a year, something like that. Yep. Okay, so we've, is that everything that we think we need for the next meeting? Um, well, be? I will ask about pesticides, uh, although it, there may not be, um, I, I think like a lot of things, everything's being reformulated, um, but I will ask uh, that part of uh, EPA. Holger, did you have some other? I, I was, it was a separate topic, but about the alternatives to get yes. more information on those. Um, Jazz, I mean. The inch, if, if there's more information. Uh, well, I think, I mean, I think we, we have what there is. The Versar report and uh, the, Nick, there is a Nick Nass report which I'll make sure, if I didn't send it to you, I will make sure you get it. And then back to Holger's suggestion about Rick Stahlhut. I mean, Rick could at least present the data from his paper. I mean, he could do it relatively quickly, I would think, in 20 minutes. Um, but in terms of 
you know, someone in the area of pharmacokinetics. I, I can't think of someone within the area of phthalates. I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, that, that have done this with dioxins or pesticides, other chemicals. I would think that it's the same principles that they could apply. I have a good working relationship with, with Matt Lorber from US EPA. He's living around the corner. He has experience with phthalates and I think he could give us a little introduction to the to the problem. I think it's it's the problem with enhanced with the fasting, with the data generated after fasting is a major issue we have to talk about. What is the impact of fasting on exposure to non-persistent chemicals, which are mainly foodborne, and especially for DEHP and the and the high molecular weight yeah. phthalates. So, do, are they routinely uh, take the samples after fasting? Requirement: They're asked to fast. I think it's overnight, and those seen in the afternoon. I think it's six hours at least. Is there yeah. a variable that describes how long they fasted? I don't think I've ever looked. There is. But it's it's uh, given in the questionnaire. And that is, I mean, is that because they're collecting lots of other things, like cholesterol and, yeah. So that, you know, could un un well underestimate the contribution from food, which is significant. But Holger, in your paper, you've got some nice graphs showing phthalate levels dropping with 48-hour fasting, right? So, I mean, can't... They considerably drop after 12 hours of fasting. Yeah. But I'm not the expert to inter interpret this data for the whole enhanced population. But the graphs that you've got in your paper could be useful in how to model it. Is the point. You can all use all the pharmacokinetic graphs, the elimination kinetics from the, from the oral dosing experiments, and the fasting graphs are the same. So there is the data is out there. We just need somebody with, with pharmacokinetic, toxicokinetic background to model this into the enhanced population. So the names that well, come well, up to my mind. It seems to me that. Uh, that's a research project. I wouldn't make it that complicated. Do you think it is that complicated, Russ? It can be, but I don't think it needs to be. Okay, could fine. Could, I mean, like think could, simple. Potentially, you know, whether the levels are 20 percent lower than you would expect because of fasting or 50 percent, I mean, more of a, a range, I would think. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you're talking about correcting for them or just assessing yeah. the impact? You have to correct for it. Well, if we are in a fasting window of 12 to 24 hours, it's a dramatic correction. Yeah. And actually, six is, in a way, it's worse because it's somewhere in between. And, but the slope is probably steep. Yeah. Uh, I think this is a major issue that has generally to be discussed regarding enhanced data. And probably most data, because I know most studies probably don't collect that information. You know, when was the last time you ate something with the spot urine samples? I know it from the German environmental survey, there is no fasting period. That's the major difference between the German data from the environmental survey and from enhanced. Could we approach it sort of in a, two, in a tiered level, one being a kind of a simplified approach where we just do some corrections based on the data that you've got in your paper, and then, and then get maybe somebody more of an expertise in pharmacokinetics that could evaluate, you know, how close or far off that simplified. My, my point was that might be a project uh, was simply I can rephrase this and ask, do you think that, say, if we confront Matt Lauber with that, that he can do it as part of a presentation to us? I would think that would be possible. Maybe together with 
Rick's experience or with, with the experience he, he made. Right, yeah, I, I would think you could pair it with Rick yeah. Stoddard, yeah. yeah. I think it would be a great idea. That's something that could be accomplished before our next meeting? Accomplished and then presented at the next mm -hmm. meeting or? Yes. Yeah, I think so. We would need to approach these two and researchers. So we would want um, both? Yeah, Matt Lauber and Rick Stahlhut. It's Stahlhut. I don't know. Yeah. And yeah. Where, where's Rick? U, uh, University of Rochester with Shauna. So. Oh. I'll, I'll need Holger to help me explain to them what it is we want, or maybe just have you do it. They, they both of them perfectly know the issue. They okay. will know what you're talking about. What we're asking is how to adjust or at least to explain the issue. I think Rick would be able to explain the issue and then Matt in, in terms of how to adjust or what kind of um, magnitude of the differences may make. Yeah. I like Andreas's point, if we could get them to actually do it and not just talk about it yeah. and present us with <laughs> Well, I, yeah. Actually, I, I would love to have a compilation, as uh, Russ mentioned it, of which of the studies in our focus are based after, are collected after fasting and which not. And it's very difficult to, to find this in the materials, method materials description. So regarding enhance, it just came to my mind a couple, to my attention a couple of months ago. I think it slipped the attention of most of the researchers in this field. And as you mentioned it, uh, Mike, uh, many of the studies are initiated to get uh, clinical parameters and they are, you know, you get them after fasting. I mean, we do, uh, Kent Carlson, uh, my colleague here is, uh, trying to keep track of the different studies, and I don't know if he knows that, but maybe he could find out what the uh, procedures are in the different studies around the world. Um, if, I mean, you know what, what the German study is doing, but I'll ask him if he knows about anything about this. Because um, I think once these things start, they tend to sort of follow method, methodology-wise, they tend to follow one another. Um, on a broader issue, uh, I think we need to discuss, are we going to do a risk assessment? What kind of risk assessment are we going to do? Are we going to do it as a committee, or are we going to ask someone outside to do that and provide it to us? Because I'm, I'm a little bit unclear as to what our path is to completing our charge. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you're talking about how the, the CHAP operates, um, the, the idea is for the, the panel to do it, although it may be possible to get help with some certain things, um, certain steps or something. Um, 
uh, as long as it's done to your specifications. Um, that's allowed, but in general, it's going to be the panels. It should be the panels risk assessment now. Um, as far as operationally what to do and what to include, I mean, that's up for discussion, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, the nuts and bolts of, of doing it, but I think the expectation, uh, I mean, it, it is the CHAPS risk assessment. And Again, this not being my area, I'm, I'm yeah. I may be asking some well, no, unintelligent this, this, questions this is, here. Um, you know, uh, may other committees uh, may, uh, I mean, I don't know exactly how they work, but I know they contract out a lot of material, a lot of the work, and um, that's a little bit different. That's not how the CHAPs have been done in the past, but, of course, the, given the size of the, the task, we'll uh, get as much help as we can. Well, let me try to make a, my, my questions a little bit more specific. EPA is going to have a workshop where they're going to be looking yeah. at phthalates, and yeah. they are going to do a cumulative risk assessment. Eventually, eventually, I, I think this risk assess or this workshop is going to be uh, just to hear, to discuss, and to hear from, like we did yesterday, um, how to go about it. What are the endpoints and all of the, the same stuff all we talked about gotta, yesterday? Yep. The things that we learned a lot yesterday, but I think that we have to sit down and say, you know, this is in, this is out. We're going to do it this way, not that yep. way. Um, but my point is that eventually they're, they're going to do what, what we, I think, are being asked to do. Well, what, they're, what the EPA IRIS program is going to do is, um, well, they're sort of in, in um, new territory uh, because normally IRIS does, they do the hazard ID and the dose response assessment. Um, um, and, of course, we're doing the whole thing. That's the difference between us and IRIS. At EPA, someone else, you know, they do that, and then other people take the IRIS. And in their uh, IRIS report might be applied to many different risk assessments. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah. can I assume correctly that given that EPA has contracted uh, an NAS panel to tell them, you know, how to conduct cumulative risk assessment right. in 2010, that's been published, Yep. that that's what eventually they will do? I think uh, most likely, I mean, why? I mean, I think it's a it's a very good report. Yes, and pretty clear. Uh, uh, I mean, not that I understand all the subtleties, but it's 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 pretty clear what the direction is. Yes. Um, so my question is, if if that's what they're going to do, is that what we should do? In other words, is that the state of the art? Um, well, I think that report is. It's the state of the art for the um, uh, phthalate syndrome effects. Can I just, uh, I think it would help at this stage to, if we turn again to the charge in the law yeah. page 26 and 27 of the unofficial compilation. Yeah. Um, what, what it says there, in my, well, it's probably open to discussion, but I would say that what we are charged with under B, examination, does not necessarily mean that we have to do a risk assessment in the sense of a risk characterization according to the silver book. Right. What it says is um, we're supposed to examine all the potential health effects now, I think it's a little open to interpretation what precisely that mean, but I read into this that this is not necessarily a full-blown risk assessment in the sense of risk characterization where, where you first consider exposures and then map it against uh, assumed safe levels and then come to a decision, are we now in the zone where the red light begins to flicker or not, well, if I, you see I, what I, I mean. I agree. It's a I think it's a decision point the chap has to make. 
as to whether to focus on those, you know, phthalate syndrome or to actually go the, the, um, the distance on all all of those other or or other endpoints beyond that. Uh, no, no, no. I think we misunderstand each other. Um, yeah. What I'm saying is, uh, I think definitely what we are supposed to do. How I interpret these uh, under B, what is listed in the law, uh, we definitely have to do what I would call and what's commonly called a hazard assessment. Right. Right but not necessarily a risk assessment. Right, and, and, and that's what I'm trying to say. I think that, well, the key word, it's not necessarily, and I think the chap has to, to decide yeah, yeah. whether you do the quantitative on multiple endpoints or just the one. I mean, that's your decision. Not even, uh, even if, say, we decided on a critical endpoint, let's say, hypothetically, the phthalate syndrome, Yeah. I... What I read here, I don't necessarily understand to mean that for even for the phthalate syndrome, we have to do a full risk characterization in the sense of a risk assessment. In other words, considering exposure first, then considering hazards, and then yeah. come to a conclusion about risks. Well, we have to be clear about the language here. Some people understand different things by risk assessment and risk characterization. But I think that's my personal interpretation. Please correct me, and maybe we have to come to agreement here now. I, I we, read I this to do. mean uh, uh, something with an emphasis on hazard assessment, definitely. Yeah. We also have to look at exposures. There is a number, uh, what was it? Yes, num number three, consider yeah. the levels likely in children, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But uh, I think I would ask the panel to consider whether they, whether you think, uh, whether you interpret anything written down here mm -hmm. to mean a risk assessment or a risk characterization where you compare quantitative levels, dosages, exposures associated with certain hazards, and then make the comparisons with exposures. Yeah. And that's why I brought up this discussion, because I don't think we've resolved, at least I haven't in my mind, how we're going to go on this. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that we, that's a critical decision we need to make up front, because if we go, we say we have to do a quantitative cumulative risk assessment then do we have the expertise to do that is the next question. So I think we need to resolve what it is we are going to do and also have a justification for that. So because it seems to me the state of the art, I, I may be wrong because it's not my area, yeah. is that silver book in terms of how to, how to do the kinds of things that we're or being they're asked really to more like the, I think, the blue-green book, the, NR, the, yep, the, or that the one phthalates well. one, yep. yeah. Um, can, I, can I just ask a point of clarification? So, Andreas, are you saying, I'm thinking back to the Camp faust paper that you presented to us at our last meeting. Where are you relative to what that approach that you have in that paper? Are you saying that's the approach you don't think we need to do? I'm, I'm not sure I know what you're yeah, yeah, saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You think we don't yeah. need to do? No. What, what we did there in the Camp faust paper is a, is a very crude first approach at some kind of risk assessment, cumulative risk assessment, uh, what this paper does more than anything is highlight the, the knowledge gaps uh, and probably maps out a possible modus operandi, very crude, there are alternatives, it needs to be refined, but I, I see nothing in these uh, under B examination here that would suggest uh, that we should carry out something similar. I think the emphasis, that, that's my interpretation, is more on hazard, on hazard assessment. But what do you mean by hazard assessment? Well, it's the Have usual, you... the usual uh, triple jump in risk assessment. You look at exposure, you look at hazards of chemicals, and then you put it together and uh, carry out what's called a risk assessment or risk characterization by comparing by asking the question, having, say, established a level quantitatively of a chemical where we think it is not safe anymore, and then you ask the question, do current exposures exceed that or come near it? 
yes or no, and that's called risk assessment. I don't think we have to do that last step. I'm not sure, but I think we should discuss that. Well, I think I think it's implied. It doesn't doesn't say it explicitly, but I think it's implied. Andreas, how about number four under there? Consider the cumulative effect of total exposure. I mean, how how would you do that otherwise? Yes, I think that's that's a point. Well, but it says consider. Well, <laughs> yeah, of course we can consider, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's well. Yes, we we need to come to an agreement there. I think well, it is open to interpretation. Our consideration there would be a recommendation and encouragement that EPA would proceed with a cumulative risk assessment of the phthalates. But that might be responsive to that, just simply to say that without the need for us to do it ourselves. <coughs> I would like to continue what Andreas has stimulated us to think about, because I think that is something that w we have to have this discussion, or we will continue to gather information and not know what we're going to do with it, with the possibility that we will end up collecting information that we don't absolutely need to answer the specific questions, and we won't have the information that it does take to answer the questions. So my thought was to step forward and look specifically at what CPSC has asked us to address. And in addition to this, there was a request for us to have some advice on what to do with these phthalates that have already been banned temporarily, and should that be extended or should it be dropped? What about other phthalates and what about alternatives? Should there be something else banned? Should there be some restrictions that we would suggest as opposed to banning? So I would use that as a very specific request that CPSC has made to us, and if we don't answer that, and we answer a lot of other stuff, they may feel that they didn't get from us what they really asked us for. So looking, if we can agree to the interpretation of specifically what Mike has told us about these banned and unbanned phthalates, I think that, that leads to a discussion of what do we need to have in hand to be able to answer that specific question. And if cumulative risk assessment is needed to be able to do that, which I don't think it is, then we would have to do that, or we would defer to EPA, since they're probably going to do it anyhow. But the risk of two of us doing it is that they will not agree. That would be bad for regulators. Well, I think uh, <clears throat> we don't have to agree, and, and it also depends on what the disagreements are and why. Yes, and, certainly. Uh, but I think, you know, you made the point the other day, uh, the bottom line is the, we're asking the chap A, shall we uh, blah, 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 make recommendations to the commission regarding any phthalates or combinations in addition to those identified in subsection A, uh, or phthalate alternatives that should be declared banned hazardous substances. In other words, shouldn't be allowed in, in, in some of these same children's products. Uh, and then uh, a little farther down, I think based on that, the staff also has to decide whether to make the interim ban permanent. Um, So if we can work from those specific questions and back away a little bit and reach agreement on yeah. what data do we need to answer those specific questions, then we at least are being responsive to the fairly narrow question that they have asked of us. And then if we want to address things that are out on the edge of that, that have to do with phthalates in general or other 
phthalate-related issues that are perhaps adjacent to the specific ones that CPSC has asked us to address. We can do that if we want and if we have time, if we have the information. But my suggestion is that we can, I, I like the hazard assessment approach, perhaps that, because that's what I have done in my career, as opposed to the more specific modeling, and I'm not against modeling if that's the way to go. But I think we can perhaps answer these questions through a hazard assessment approach, and perhaps the data, I mean, we, we've done this, we've done hazard assessments with less data than are available on phthalates, so I think it's doable, and I think if we can reach agreement starting from the end point and working back a little bit, we will be more efficient in being able to get this done. Well, if we just focus on the, the phthalates that are currently banned, I mean, is it safe to assume, and I don't know this area, that those were not banned on the basis of a cumulative risk assessment, right? No. It was, they were banned on the hazard assessment process that you're talking about. Is that correct? I, 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 I think per, that's pretty much it. I mean, I, there was no cumulative risk assessment per se. I think they were concerned about cumulative effects. I, I would ask if we could be a little more specific. I think you guys are using terms, and I'm not sure the distinction. If I'm being I, I apologize. No, but, no I'm in but the same when boat. When you say risk assessment as opposed to hazard assessment, I don't, I don't know exactly what you're saying. If someone, if either Vern or Andreas could be more specific, it would help me a lot. Yeah, what are what are the steps that we would take and, and go and decide that the f three that are banned stay banned? So, and what in would particular, we do? I'd like to hear. Relative to what I understand, Andreas, in the Andreas, sorry, in the Court and Camp Faust paper, relative to that, what's on the table or off the table mm -hmm. from that? Exactly. Can I? Yeah. I totally agree with what uh, what Bernd just said. We, I, I, I think that's the bottom line. We uh, let's work backwards and ask the question: What kind of information do we need in answer to fulfil the charges? And what would be a very helpful, and you said it already, would be to um, get information about what criteria were used in order to um, come to the decision to ban the three ones in the law. Is, is that documented somewhere? What criteria were used? Um, I, I don't think it is that well documented. Uh -huh. Uh, I think that's the problem. I, I think that the European ban is uh, there is a little explanation in the in the um, documents, but in ours there isn't. The law itself doesn't c really have a justification, um, and there's, as far as I know, not much of a of a written history of of how and why things were done. Okay, if that's not the case, then I think we should. Uh, a first step would be for us to reflect on criteria that would. Uh, support a decision to ban something. But I don't know what they are, but I think we should be clear about them. And secondly, in answer to your points, Chris, um, I'm also aware the terminology and the use of phrases in this area is sometimes a little confusing, and I would strongly recommend, since we are operating in the USA, to follow the terminology used by NRC in starting with the red book, ending with the silver book. Let, let, shall we agree on that? And these terms are very clearly defined in the silver book. I mean, we can take the silver book. It goes back and explains the, the whole history of how they developed this risk assessment framework and the terms they use. Shall we agree on that for simplicity? I certainly agree with that. I think for my enlightenment, and, and perhaps Chris as well, if, if one of you could outline in general terms what the process is, I, that would be helpful to me. Okay, the, the, I will have to pass over to some of my colleagues here because, but, but generally the, the um, and that is terribly important and often neglected, and I think that's what we should apply ourselves here to. The, the process starts with a stage of problem formulation and defining the context, and I think we're about 
to do that, and we're, we're very near to that point. So th that that step is so important. It then, as Bernd has outlined already, uh, that helps us to decide what kind of information do we actually need. So we need to define the context and the problem. I don't think that should be very difficult. And then the core of risk assessment or risk characterization begins with exposure assessment and Holger, for example, is an expert there. It asks the question, what are, what are likely exposures to the chemical considered? This will vary according to population, subgroups, age, etc., etc., but it basically asks that question. And in parallel, um, a process goes on which is commonly referred to as hazard assessment. It asks the question, uh, what information do we have, first of all, qualitatively on the effect profile produced by the chemical in question? Yeah, we've already also considered it partly, you know, cancer, da -da -da, um, all the endpoints. What is happening? And secondly, it asks the question, is there quantitative dose-response information available for any of these endpoints? And if yes, um, it then if possible, concludes with a process whereby risks associated with certain exposures or dosages are quantified. So th that's that box. So exposure assessment, hazard assessment goes on in parallel. Then the final step of risk assessment or risk characterization is to unite these two steps by asking the question, are the levels that we've established as likely to occur through exposure assessment, are they reaching a zone which the hazard assessment tells us is associated with risk? Except all this has to be done in terms of a mixture, not a single chemical. Yeah, yes, that's an additional issue, but there are, there are ways of doing this. Approaches have been mapped out yeah. how to do that. I mean, in a sense, um, if you're going to do mixtures, you kind of could start all over. I mean, do a hazard ID for the individuals, but then for the mixtures. Um, and dose response for the individuals, and then for the mixtures. So it's, um, it complicates it that much more. So Andreas, you would not support us using a hazard index approach? Well, hazard index or whatever is far too specific an approach. I mean, that's just one way of, of uh, doing a cumulative risk assessment. There are others. But let's not get too hung up about a hazard index approach or not at this stage. Okay, I'm sorry to keep pushing you, but I'm. why not? I, it helps me if I can think through those kinds of steps. What are we going to, when we talk about data, what are we going to do with the data? We keep talking about biomonitoring studies, uh, trying to, and I, I was thinking of blending the biomonitoring data into. No, I think I agree with Bernd. What Bernd says, if, uh, we, we have to be clear what, what, we, what we're aiming for, and my feeling is that in order to reach, reach decisions about continuation of, of prohibitions and bans, uh, I'm not sure we need to get quantitative, or let alone uh, get very complicated with, with mixtures, risk assessment, or cumulative risk assessment. That's my opinion, but we, we should consider that first and to, in order to simplify, because otherwise, as Bernd said, we end up in a situation of having uh, assembled facts which then we realize at a later stage we don't need at all. Am I correct then in, in this approach you've outlined, if, if Holger were to convince us that um, cumulatively we were being exposed to uh, one milligram per kilogram per day of, of phthalates and we know from animal data that um, three milligrams per day per kilogram per day causes an adverse effect then we would apply some factor to say that that's close enough to the, 
the animal data that tells us it's adverse that we're going to say this is uh, a problem in humans. And, and yeah, that, that is one way, but I would say uh, that is already very quantitative and potentially uh, complicated. I mean, in my mind, uh, mixture risk assessment or cumulative risk assessment would first of all start asking questions like, such as, what is the evidence that co-exposure to several phthalates in fact qualitatively exacerbates risk? You don't have to be too quantitative. You ask questions, in what direction uh, would this likely uh, move a dose response curve for an in individual phthalate? Questions like this, without having to be too quantitative at this stage. Or similarly, what is the likely anticipated effect of co-exposure to other antiandrogens, etc.? But isn't that sort of approach important, or, or maybe potentially the most important, um, when it's the, when you're in the process of trying to gather data? So if you don't have to go out and get the quantitative data, then you can start asking qualitative questions, and then along the way decide yes, we need to go further, or no, we don't need to go further. But I think we're in a position where we've seen a lot of data, um, yeah. and we have it at our fingertips already. So yeah. I, I, I would propose that we go ahead and think about more of a quantitative approach. No, whoa, 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 whoa. I think steady, steady. Because <laughs> why, would you, why would you need quantitative data on something very complicated, cumulative risk assessment, if the question is to decide whether we ha want to uh, whether we are of the opinion that the existing ban on certain phthalates should be continued or not. In my mind, you don't need this information. In my mind, what you need in order to answer these questions is a, is a hazard assessment. I guess the, the problem gets back to what do you mean by that, by hazard assessment? Um, because I, I don't quite follow how you would do that in a qualitative sense only. Come to the conclusion that something is bad, because to me that almost implies that there has to be some quantitative aspect of that. Am I wrong? I mean, well, I see it that way. Of course, that's what I do. But um, hazard, I, hazard assessment has quantitative aspects, does response analysis. Well, but once the, the, you do, once you do dose response, then you're moving beyond um, the just the hazard assessment. But I think ah, okay, that's a terminology issue. Uh, according to the Silver Book, you don't. Maybe we should look at that. And yeah, but uh, well, if suppose we did a the most simple minded kind of a quantitative assessment uh, not worry too much about uh, you know advancing the state of the art uh, using the principles applying the principles in the the uh, NRC report on phthalates maybe even limiting it only to the phthalate syndrome effects, for starters at least. Um, is, is that doable? Of course. Of course. But here's a thought which, which I'd like to put to you for discussion. Um, maybe that makes it clear. Um, in my opinion, it is very problematic to support the decision for or against a ban by doing a, a full-blown risk characterization, risk assessment. The problem is this. Uh, Holger has, has very eloquently informed us about uh, the substitution processes. So um, exposures to phthalates are they're, they're like moving goalposts. There's already, we are fully aware of this, a, a substitution process going on because decisions are made by industry to uh, limit the use of certain phthalates which they regard as uh, problematic or for whatever reason, and there's a move towards others. So, for example, hypothetically, a due to this process, a risk assessment for 
DEHP may conclude that because the current exposure levels have gone down, that the risk attributable to DEHP is now, I'm making up an example, negligible, right? Right. Then if you want to use that outcome of a risk characterization, risk assessment process, that would be typical. Yeah. If you want to use that to now, as a criterion, to decide on a ban or not, you may end up in a very absurd situation. You then decide, okay, currently nothing to fear from DEHP. Yeah. The reaction to that, and so then you, hypothetically you would argue no need to ban DEHP. If this happens, then there will be a substitution process going on in the other direction. Right. We will see more exposure to DEHP. And then in the future, you might, might find yourself confronted with a situation, aha, now exposures to DHP are so high, they're getting us into the zone of attributable risks, hypothetically. Right, and I think So that I conclude from that that a full-blown risk assessment is unsuitable as a basis to decide for or against a ban. Mm -hmm. It has to be based on a hazard assessment. Does that make sense? But, but couldn't a ha uh, risk assessment inform a hazard assessment? In other words, I understand what you're saying. There's a moving target in terms of the exposure levels of these chemicals, and we probably could even study that in NHANES if we had, had the opportunity to look from year to year to year, right? Um, but but we, could, we could also, um, you know, make up, I shouldn't say make up, but consider scenarios where we say, okay, now if DEHP actually did increase by 20%, then here's where you are. If it decreased, you know, we could, we could consider it in a lot of different right. cases. Right, or one, one thing I've done is if you, you know, turn back the clock to a certain date and say, well, you know, when this whole business started, uh, you're darn right. You wouldn't, you would definitely ban this chemical and you wouldn't want to replace it. I mean, there, there's ways to deal with the moving target issue. Um, I think that's, a, compared to the other issues, uh, not, not uh, insurmount, insurmountable, but. Um, I, know. I know, I know, but it helps us yeah. answer the question according to Bernd, which, which Bernd, Bernd, yeah. Bernd has, has brought up. Uh, what kind of information do you need? If, for example, we reflect on this a little more, then immediately becomes clear that for these discussions, we don't need exposure data. Well, for there, are other, there are other points here in the charge yeah. where we do need exposure data, yeah, but yeah. in order to argue for or against a ban of certain phthalates, we don't need exposure data. Well, it, we need to have the hazard profile. Uh, but uh, when you say exposure data, do you mean like biomonitoring data or do you mean hypothetically, like for example, we have data showing migration from the products and so you could um, say, uh, you know, given the known toxicity characteristics and th this ex amount of exposure it would be below any level of concern or above and um, assess the alternatives that way. Um, so, you know, it, it, if a particular alternative, say, didn't migrate, um, it could have a higher toxicity. If it migrated a lot, it would have to have a much lower toxicity. Um, but I mean, you're, you, you, yep. you raise uh, good good points, uh, and it's. Um, but uh, uh, you're right. We I, I think we need to sort of think through what are the steps that we want to do to answer these different questions, and what do we need to do? What do we um, uh, want to do, or and what can we do? Yeah, and, and I'm just wondering, Andreas, uh, sort of to get us off of starting gate here. Um, I'm a very visual learner, so I have to see yeah. things to really analyze and, and digest. 
would it help us if you were to use the process you've been talking about with relationship to the three that have been banned and go through your process and show us you know what that would lead us to that way we could say that's oh, how dear. we should go or I'm being put on the spot here I don't know I can <laughs> I don't know I can I can do this but that's why I asked is there is the documentation of the decision making process what criteria were used to arrive at the decision to ban the three satellites in the law yeah and I, re I, I don't think there's a lot um, Uh, well, Phil, is that sure, go ahead. Anything we can obtain that's useful? Ann Clausen with Latham and Watkins. Um, in 2005, uh, there was legislation in the EU which looked very much the same. It put a pretty much permanent, well, not on any of them was it permanent, but it was a, a fuller ban on the three lower molecular weight and then uh, interim type ban on the uh, higher molecular weight phthalates. It did provide for a reassessment of that, which is happening right now. With regard to the higher molecular weight, particularly DINP and DIDP, they had also done risk assessments that showed no risk. But they decided to go ahead with the legislation and explicitly stated that was on the basis of the precautionary principle. After that was passed, California passed legislation that was explicitly modeled on the EU uh, and the legislature did no kind of hazard assessment. They just picked up on what the EU had done. When the CPS, uh, CPSIA was being promulgated, uh, Senator Feinstein from California wanted the phthalates added to the CPSIA on the same basis that it was in California. So again, it was added to the legislation uh, really as a political process with no kind of hazard assessment explicitly done by the legislators. And it's, uh, th thank you. Uh, I mean, that's my understanding of the process. I don't know that there's a written record that we could refer to. Um, it, it, it's, for me at least, it's secondhand information, third hand, fourth, whatever. Um, but that's my understanding of the process. But there wasn't a, uh, um, uh, you know, it's not like a formal rulemaking where you do a risk assessment and so on. There were risk assessments done in the in the EU, and it's debatable. They don't necessarily they didn't necessarily support the ban the EU ban. Uh, I think the EU ban was more of a precautionary print, as as they call it in the EU. Uh, if you're not sure, ban it. Um, kind of approach um, and I, I think anything after that uh, simply uh, mirrored what was in the European or more or less mirrored what was in the European ban um, and the uh, as part of this um, that they said oh well we'll have a chap uh, and the chap is to was kind of a um, uh, a multi-purpose it's to look at the, the alternatives and also to do the actual risk on the um, the three interim band ones or weigh in on the three interim band ones and to do the risk assessment I mean I I don't think anyone would argue with the, the three permanently banned ones um, they're well there's no risk assessment in part because they weren't really being used. I think that in the EU ban, they said we we did the put the three permanently banned ones in not so much because they were being used, but because we didn't want them to become substitutes. Um, it was a preemptive uh, act. Um, you know, the other three, the interim banned ones, it's you know they're not. It, it's not so clear. Um, you know, DINP is uh, may fit in the, um, the phthalate syndrome category, but it is weaker. The other two, I I'm not so sure 
uh, I, you know, I don't think there's any strong evidence uh, that they cause the phthalate, phthalate syndrome thing. So, you know, those, they're in sort of a, a, an in-between category. So for us, they ended up as a as an interim ban, and they talk about this a little bit in the the European um, document, which is on your CD. But I'll make sure you can find it if you want to read what's there. Uh, but but that's that. I mean the the. I guess the answer to all of the some of the questions, you know, why are you doing it this way? Uh, why is Congress doing it this way? I mean, the chap is to answer some of these questions. Mm. Yes, th thank you very much for these explanations. Um, but I think it would be a little unfair to summarize the precautionary principle as applied in the EU by saying, if you're unsure, ban it. Yeah, it doesn't well. work like that. <laughs> If we did Sorry, it, I'll, I'll, if we did it this way, uh, we'll, we would have no ca chemicals. We'll, we'll, you know? we'll instruct the jury to <laughs> ignore that <laughs> remark. But uh, having said that, if I mean, we, we find we, that the criteria, you know, the, yeah, if yeah. we find that the criteria used um, are, shall we say, a little obscure, then I would think it would be one of our key tasks to reflect a little on these criteria to be absolutely transparent and a good way to start would be to consider the three that are banned already and reflect uh, reflect on criteria and arguments which uh, uh, we think would support and justify that with the aim of applying it to the others and then see where we end up is that a workable way forward I think I think we will, we will have to be transparent and clear yes. with criteria. Is and you had a comment? Yes, my my assumption that when a decision is made under the precautionary principle, there is an expectation that when data are available, it'll be analyzed. And it isn't a matter of second guessing how somebody else made a decision. That decision wasn't fully based on data. It is based on on a composite of, of things that were true at the time, one of which was there wasn't enough data to really make a firm decision, but we're going to make one anyhow. So we're not, we're not at risk of second guessing somebody because now we have data. And that's how the process should work. But Mike, a question of you regarding what the options are. We've only talked about banning or not banning. Isn't it possible that something could be restricted in its content in products without banning it. And it would still therefore be useful in products, but we have restricted the level in it so that what migrates out into children's mouths or skin someplace or in, in the diet is restricted down to a level where it represents an acceptable risk. Now maybe that level would have to be at a concentration where the product no longer is flexible and therefore the addition of the plasticizer is a moot point because you, it wouldn't work at that level. But it kind of keeps us out of the mentality of saying that it either has to be banned or not. Yeah. And uh, that's a good point. And I, you know, I, the, the, the term banned hazardous substance, it, I think that it literally means something that doesn't comply with our regulations. So uh, it's an un unfortunate to have the word ban in there, but it really means, well, the, the other, the six phthalates are limited to 0.1%. So in effect, it's, a, it's really a performance standard, you could say, or something like that. Uh, it's a regulation, not so much as a ban. Um, we, don't, we can avoid using that word and say regulate or limit. It already does what you what you just said. It it regulates it to a certain level. Right, and and we don't, you know, I think it's okay to think outside the box a little bit. We it doesn't necessarily have to be a thumbs up, thumbs down. It's a uh, it could be uh, some other uh, none of the above if that's what you want to say. Managing it, I mean, the the step that wasn't added here is risk management. And if the risk can be managed by lowering the level to an extent where the exposure 
is not high enough to be of concern relative to the toxicity, then it is successfully managed. Uh, we haven't talked about for what part of the population. Is it for everybody or just a subset or for just those who are insensitive? Those are other issues that we need to deal with as we talk about are we comfortable or not with a certain level of exposure. But it make, by, by managing it to a certain level makes it more of a quantitative process and not just an all or none process. I, I guess certainly that thought process is would would be a criterion to to support this decision making. That's one way, but there are others. But sure. that's certainly one way. I think all I'm saying is we have to be clear about about this. And and also let me add, I don't think that's solvable um, in a Wednesday afternoon. It requires careful condition, and maybe that's one of the pieces of homework we should agree on for next time. That was my question, is how can we proceed so that when we meet again in, in uh, December or January, we have something that we can discuss and, and then make the next step forward? Uh, in, you know, quantitative risk assessment is a, is a way to solve, a, to make these decisions, and it's not the only way. But, you know, it's, it's not a bad way either. Just kind of an uh, aside, um, wouldn't there be precedent for other chemicals or metals um, in, in terms of, you know, lead in products or cadmium yeah. or, I mean, uh, you know, phthalates are just one out of a universe. Um, right. And there's been other bands and there's been other, you know, percentage of, you know, a metal or a chemical allowed. I mean, in terms of well, using in a precedent. Well, in lead, for instance, the way our regulations um, at least before the CPSIA, the way the, the rationale was, uh, lead's naturally occurring for one thing, and it's a, it, it tends to be ubiquitous, but it, it's a contaminant. Um, and so we would assume a certain background level of exposure and take that into account in the, in the risk calculations. Um, uh, and that's how they would arrive at, you know, going calc back calculating uh, a level of exposure that's allowed. Um, for other things, like phthalates, we might consider, well, are these things that can be regulated by other agencies, you know? Uh, if it's intentionally added to drugs or whatever, um, you know, we might say, nor well, you know, this is not a normal risk assessment process we're talking about, but normally we would say, well, if, if it can be, if most of the exposure is from something under FDA or EPA jurisdiction, we'll, we'll say, well, let them deal with it. But in, in this case where, you know, you have a lot of stuff that's, in food and in the environment, and it's not clear whether it's something that is, uh, can be addressed. You know, we, it's coming from so many sources, and, you know, some of them are clearly in somebody's jurisdiction, but others, like how it gets into food, uh, maybe not, you know. Um, maybe that's just because it ends up in the environment. I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, thinking out loud here, but... Uh, um, but lead is very similar to that. You know, if you go back, and even now, it's it's purposely added to products. Yeah. And it's in the environment from gasoline. It's probably in our, you know, our food supplies, our dust. Yeah. And decisions were made. I was just wondering if there's, you know, rather than trying to yeah, reinvent... Yeah. Well, le le way. lead, we would assume that there's a certain background level that is always going to be there in that it can't be regulated by, you know, EPA taking it out of gasoline. You know, there, there's some um, background level left that we have to accept. So we sort of subtract that out of what we say you can be exposed to. Um, for phthalates, uh, I guess we could just look at total, it, I mean, if there were a way, because this came up with the DINP, if there were a way, uh, 
to do it, I would have said, gee, you have this much total exposure. Um, you know, how much sort of room does that leave? Uh, 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 in other words, well, if, if DINP is adding to that risk, um, we would have explicitly taken that into account in, in, at least in my risk assessment, I would have done it that way. I would have said, um, you know, there's this much risk from the DINP, which is not bad, but if you add in the background and it puts you over um, the level of concern, then, you know, it is a problem. So that, uh, you know, maybe that's one approach we can take is, you know, you have total exposure depending on, on what the risk from that is, because I'm not sure what it is, if it's, you know, over or below that sort of um, level of concern, whatever you want to call it. But um, if that's really that high, then, um, you know, uh, adding to that, I suppose, does make a difference, even in small amounts. Um, but I, I, you know, that's one way to look at it is whatever total exposure is and then say, do these toys, um, you know, put you over a certain level. Well, am I wrong, Andreas, that w what you were saying that you, you don't want to go that way? You don't want to say there is some level that if we go above that, we have a problem. No, you want to say they're qualitative if it, if it shifts. No, 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 no. I don't. I can't. I don't want to be prescriptive at this stage. But I think we we have to enter a process whereby we map out options. Yeah. What yeah. what you've just said is definitely one. But there are others. We have to map them out, be clear about it, and then look at it and make a decision and work from there. And then answer the question: What if we agree on a certain option or a modus operandi? Then uh, yeah. the next question is: What data do we really need? I didn't try to be prescriptive, it's just... Well, how do we define the options and, and move forward? Well, one option definitely is the one mapped up by Bernard, where you consider exposures. This is the, the, that would lead us into a full-blown risk characterization, risk assessment project, and then ask the question, uh, uh, can the exposures resulting from toys, uh, can this be managed by reducing the levels of phthalates in these toys if that's not possible for technical reasons, for example, that's one possible line of argumentation, then there is a good case for a ban. That's one, one way of doing it, but I think there, there are other options as well, and these need to be ma mapped out. One other option is uh, one I, I mentioned, I haven't made up my mind at all, uh, which would be go the way of hazard characterization. In by, in by hazard, you mean not uh, going? You mean going as far as a dose response? Yes, dose response. Yes. And okay. Um, and what? It, but but to what end? If we're not doing exposure. For example, that's a good question. Do we really need a, quali a quantitative hazard assessment or aren't questions uh, along the lines of how likely is it uh, that this and that chemical induces the phthalate syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. You yeah. know, this. I'm not absolutely clear about this at this stage, but we need to reflect on questions of that nature. Would, would clarification come by, again, applying whatever process you wish to the three that are banned or and or the three that are interim banned and let, let us as a committee see what the different options tell us and uh, yes de definitely yes I think it, a good way of doing it would be to see what the Europeans have done the thought process there not that we might want to model ourselves on Europeans totally we are in America here but just keep an eye well I think what what they did, the, the scientists, the, um, uh, the, 
the programs did risk assessments of individual phthalates, although they were aware of the possibility of, of cumulative risks. And, uh, it, uh, you know, and then somehow the, the, le the legislature, the um, uh, uh, voted, you know, as we did in the U.S., it, it was a legislation that did the ban. So there wasn't necessarily a direct link between the science and the, um, um, and the, and the regulation. Um, in fact, we had some follow after the dust settled, we had some follow-up conversations with the scientists there, and our we, you know, someone said, "Well, how come they banned it and you didn't?" And uh, at that level, risk assessor to risk assessor, uh, we were pretty much in agreement on 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 things. Um, but the decision to ban it was based on precaution. Maybe it would be productive for us to bear in mind that this process can be carried out totally without um, totally or let's say independent of this uh, classic risk assessment we're, we're all used to. I mean someone mentioned it. It could be based on a decision uh, to say we don't want substitution to go in the um, to go in favor of a certain phthalate. If we don't ban it, this will happen. We don't want that, and therefore we ban it. Simplified argumentation. But in no, uh, if, if you consider this thought process, you will notice that, um, well, you will have to ask the question, answer the question, why do you not want to go, substitution to go that way? So what health hazards are you concerned about and then you have a health hazard assessment step in there but this doesn't necessarily have to be quantitative that makes makes a lot of sense yeah um hypothetically that would or, be one option to go yeah semi i mean you want to it's quantitative in the sense you don't want to go to something that's more toxic but you also have to be mindful of the exposure potential. I think for most of these, the, the actual exposure migration seems to be about the same, but in case it's not, you would have to consider that as well. But it would be kind of a, a semi-quantitative approach. Yeah. Okay. For my taste, we are leading a too much hypothetical discussion right now, because I think we are still in the stage of data collection. And I think no matter, no, no matter which way the, the discussion may lead us, we need to face the fact that we have to sort out the basic data. As you said, we need a discussion about the endpoints. We need to harmonize all of the dates in terms of the endpoints plus the substitution products. We need to collect the data there. We need to have a look what toxicity data for the phthalates is there in regard to the endpoint the most sensitive. We have to check if this data is present for the substitution products and we need this data for the substitution products too. So I think it's a perfect discussion we led right now but this is going to be a discussion for the next or the meeting in, in, in a half year's time. Yes, that that is true, but it is a very important one because, well, in the silver book that would uh, fall under problem definition, context definition. It, it is very important to do this because we may find, because whatever decision we ne take at that stage will then drive uh, what data we need. But uh, let me uh, come back to... Um, to the text, the charge, I think the legislator had something in mind when they, and here I agree with you, Olga, when they listed uh, certain things we also have to examine, for example, uh, uh, the likely levels in children, etc., etc. Maybe the legislator had in mind that our deliberation should follow a certain structure. So there are definitely data we need to look at and analyze because it's listed here. 
And no doubt this will help in this thought process to decide in favour or against the ban of certain chemicals. I, I agree with you at one level, but at another level I'm, I'm a little bit unclear. You know, if you just take the, the, the problem of which phthalates are we talking about or which alternatives, we, we haven't even come close to talking about that. How are we going to decide uh, the universe of, of phthalates and alternatives, the ones that we're going to be concerned with? Is it going to be all of those? And if it is, I mean, then you're saying to me that we have to have a matrix. Down this side, all of the phthalates and all the alternatives, and then over here in different columns, exposure data um, in different uh, in children, in, in the fetus, in pregnant women, uh, whatever. Um, is that what you're suggesting that we need? And if that's the case and we agree on that, how are we going to get that put together, that matrix? I think uh, the core data is on the six phthalates here. And it definitely says we need uh, information about exposure. And the exposure, I mean, as Mike said it, uh, both based on biomonitoring data, but also on usage data, uh, migration experiments, and so on. And as Andreas pointed out, we, we have to be aware as soon as we res restrict one phthalate, it's likely that other phthalates or substitution products come into the market with the same amount of production volume. So we need information on these possible likely substitution products. I think we discussed some of these substitution products. We discussed DINGE, Earl did it too. We discussed DPHP and there are possibly other substitution products, but we have to keep these products in mind right now. Use the word likely. Uh, and, and if you look at the one of the EPA documents that we received, there's a whole list there of alternatives that either are being used or likely to be used. Um, are we going to go through that list one by one and say this is the one we're going to be talking about and this one we're not interested in? And if so, then what criteria are we going to use? So this leads to, you know, this is not a simple matter. No, but a, de a decision on the acceptability of an alternative is a decision of the future. And we, we can't decide whether or not to make some recommendation on a phthalate based on what we think the risk is of an alternative that we think the industry might go to. Or we'll never make a decision on, on the phthalates. The decision of whether or not an an alternative is acceptable is in the hands of the regulators. We can't really make a judgment now that will preclude the possibility that some company will make, will approach EPA or CPSC or FDA with their choice and the agency says absolutely not. We, we don't want another chemical like that as an alternative to the one that we are looking at from the standpoint of managing. So I think it's important for us to know that there are alternatives, but I don't think we can make a decision on a phthalate based on what we fear might be an alternative until it happens. Yeah, but, but number 2B7 yeah. says explicitly we should uh, consider the alternatives. Well, it says. We, we have some alter well. Consider possible similar health effects. Yeah. I mean, some of, of them phthalates. are already being used. Yes. So, uh, you know, the hypothetically, uh, you know, there's a, an infinite universe of things that could be used. I think we have to take our best shot and start with the ones that we know are being used. And um, if it if there's something that looks like it's going to be used, we can add it. But it's uh, we can't hope to have everything cover every possible alternative. Um, gets back to if, if we need this matrix that Holger is arguing for, yeah. then we've got to make some decisions on specific phthalates and alternatives. And I would assume we have to have a rationale for why we select one and not another. I think 
Paul and Earl yesterday pointed the way because we are focusing on the phthalate syndrome. So looking structure wise at the chemicals which might be the replacement products, we might have to look if these similar products, replacement products might have similar effects. I don't think we've made that decision yet. The, no, we, we didn't make any uh, According uh, to regard to the phthalate syndrome as their endpoint, I don't think we've made that decision. I mean, would it, would it help to write some of these things down, like write a, a list of things, decisions you need to make, uh, maybe write down some possible approaches, like a qualitative and a quantitative uh, approach? That's what, just listening to this, I was going to suggest, because it seems like we're talking about two or three different things yeah. kind of at the same time. And I think, at least in terms of process, is thinking about the different approaches that are available and then what's needed for the different approaches, what we have available. And then we can make a much more informed decision. You know, we have these, yeah. you know, whatever, three or four possible approaches what's needed, what's available, and then how do we go forward, and then, of course, picking one of the approaches, because there's a, you know, just listening, to, you know, different, you know, the discussion's not completely well, we're, meshing in terms we're, of. I think we're also talking on different levels. I think, you know, I think this is the highest level. What's the, the bottom line when we're all done? Um, how to do it is is another level, and then some of the nitty gritty details is yet another. So, yeah, and, and again, the point I try to make is how do we going to get there? How do we move forward? Are we going to do it here? Are we going to try to hash out what you just said that we need to do, or are we going to ask uh, ESC to do that and give it back to us, and we we digest it and comment and make changes or no, no, I think that's a, that's a task we shouldn't and can't delegate. I think we have to do that ourselves, yeah. uh, but we can't do it in the re, in the remainder during the remainder of this day. So, uh, nor should we rush. It, my suggestion would be uh, we could all independently think about this, uh, and each of us perhaps prepare what can we call it a kind of submission or discussion paper for next time? This could be circulated well in advance yeah, and refined, and that's then for next time the first discussion topic. In, I, I, I was going to suggest that we each jot down what we're on paper, a flow chart or bullets or something, um, and, uh, and then get it, do it well before the next meeting so that the next meeting we can um, see what we agree on. Yeah, I was going to actually suggest that as well, but, you know, potentially since our next meeting's not till December, yeah. at the earliest, you know, maybe a conference call where we can, you know, spend a few hours in October, November talking about some of the approaches. Because I think if we do come together in December, January, we you know, it would be nice to have a decision in terms of approaches and needs before then and agree upon at that time. Like in terms that these are, from the standpoint that these are public meetings, can we have a conference call? Yeah, we, we have had conference calls in the past and, and you know, this is a um, kind of a, a nuts and bolts kind of thing and it's, it's just to, to really to prepare us for the, for the real meeting. Okay, so, so the, I think that would be okay. Then the plan would be for us individually as committee members to come up with a document uh, that we will circulate among the other committee members. Yeah. And yeah. then we will have a conference call where we can discuss what each of us has proposed and then hopefully come to a, a consensus that will drive the meeting in December. Can you be more specific of what sh we should have in that document so that we don't end up with apples and oranges yeah. and nuts and well, I was actually thinking kind of the, the same thing because there are, you know, different pieces and each of us have different expertise. So maybe, you know, I don't know, Mike or, or a way of framing the main points and then each of us could 
continue to outline it or fill it in because for certain aspects, I know I won't have the expertise and for other aspects I will. Uh, but, but it would help, you know, frame, you know, exactly what is needed in, in this document and what are some of the questions. It, it would be helpful if, if we had a sense of what different people are going to address, I mean, based on your expertise. Uh, although you wouldn't be limited to that, it would make sure we cover all of these things. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if we would we start with the framework or uh, I guess it, or get the submission some submissions first I think we I guess it would make sense to have some sort of a framework you know very general in terms of the questions yeah to answer the approaches that are available the data needs, decisions. I mean, you know, more of a you know very general outline that we can yeah. pick okay. pieces to fill in. Okay. Could, could it might could it be based on the various elements of our charge? That's. Uh, I think that's part of it. And then sub sections that deal with each of those. What do we need to do this? And yeah. Also come back to, comes back to where we were yesterday, which phthalates, what age group, what metabolites. I mean, these are all factors that we would have to take into account so that we begin to segregate that small number of phthalates that are of highest priority versus those that are out on the margins, those that are of highest toxicity versus those that are out on the margins. And those are the things that would allow me to be able to say, well, the four phthalates that I think we really need to focus on and these two endpoints, that, that's where the meat of this is. And the other things, we will have less certainty because they're less toxic, there's less exposure, whatever the factors might be. So I would hope that as a group we can begin to narrow down those kinds of things as well to give us focus on where to spend our energy. And it would also help if we could get sooner than later Paul's and Earl's slides from yesterday, copies of those. I don't think we've got those yet. Yes. Well, I think in answer to Bernard's point, I think there can be no discussion that the six phthalates mentioned in, in the legislation are the ones. that That's the minimum. Yeah. And I would say in terms of substitution or proposed substitution products, it's DINCH. Um, DHPH at the very least. Yeah. Possibly more, but so we're eight already. Well, there's, Minimum. There's, there's a mm -hmm. handful that are actually in use. DPHP we have, I don't think we've seen yet, but it's a, it's a potential. Well, Mike, is that something that, that your office could put together for us? Um, a very, a framework? Well, yeah, that and, and also in terms of Burns' uh, point of identifying the phthalates, if, if those could be just enumerated and, you know, why we wouldn't consider some of the alternatives that they're, they're not in production or uh, yeah. there are no data. Uh, yeah, and, and we're, we're sort of working on that, and, and act, I'm actually going to, try to get in touch with some of the industry people to to get more information on that list uh, about the chemicals on that list uh, you know which ones are really used and so on um, I don't think we need to go too far down that list I think you know start with the six you know, there's a few everybody has, like the isobutyls not on there. There's, everyone has a few uh, or, uh, that they might add to that list, and we'll, we could certainly do that. Um, I noticed the EPA document had eight phthalates. In right, right. And part of that, I mean, the, the, the pentol is there not because it's used, but because of its uh, 
activity in that assay. So it's it's almost like a model compound. Um, you know, some of those like the up to N hexyl. I someone told me that you know N hexyl no one really uses anymore, but it's because it's active in that assay. It it's something we might consider at least for one part, the hazard ID part or something like that. Um, and I could also, you know, conceive of, you know, because we have so many chemicals, um, whatever the final process is, all of the chemicals don't necessarily have to make it all the way through. Envision the document that we put together would have something as simple as a table of all the phthalates and um, alternatives and, and then a short discussion of, of why we chose uh, some and not others to really. And, and if anyone used or thought about using uh, a substitute that, you know, wasn't high on our list, it would, wouldn't be that hard for either them or us. We would have a framework to go through. Yes. One other thing that we haven't talked about, and that is the role of judgment in this process of us being able to make recommendations. I don't think any of the approaches that we've talked about lead you down to a final line in the evaluation that says yes or no. It's a matter of our judgment on when you get down where you've got all the things on a page that are important to make a decision, the decision isn't there. The decision comes from us. And it's a matter of judgment of whether the differential between exposure and toxicity is sufficient that I would accept that this is an acceptable risk. And what you would accept might be different from what I would accept. But nonetheless, th this, there, there isn't a recipe for taking this definitively to a yes or no answer. And I think we have to be prepared to have a discussion when we arrive at our interpretation of what's available to make a decision, then there's another step ahead of us to make a judgment of what it means. And does it translate into a recommendation to restrict or not? We haven't talked about that, but that's another task that's not easy. I mean, along the same lines, I mean, uncertainty is something we need to of think it. of. Yeah. I mean, whatever, every step of the way, we might as well uh, do it as, as we go along is th these are what the uncertainties are because. Yeah. have to be able to document well what that judgment is yeah. because the, the, the means by which we make the judgment is often more important than the decision because that shows the strength of your conviction. And if we end up looking at individual phthalates, but recognize that it's part of a family of phthalates out there in, in exposure, that becomes part of the judgment. If we don't have a quantitative way of adjusting a level of something to take into account that it's a cumulative effect, we at least have to have that as one of the judgments that we have introduced an additional factor based on the exposure to multiple phthalates and that's perhaps why we are as conservative as we are in this judgment because of that nature of the exposure. All right. I'd l I need to have a break. <laughs> I suspect others may as well. So let's uh, reconvene 15-20 um, minutes. Okay, let's uh, reconvene. Is there any more discussion about the issue that we were talking about before we broke for lunch, or can we consider that uh, uh, complete at this stage? Mike is going to put together a, a framework, and then individually we're going to uh, build on that and share uh, our contributions by before our conference call. Okay, hearing no um, 
further discussion on that. <clears throat> um, I'd like to move on in, in the, the brief time that we have. Two of the members have to leave uh, shortly after uh, lunch. So um, <clears throat> I thought we would take what time we have available to discuss a couple of other uh, issues. Um, and one of the issues that I, we, we need to discuss is what are the endpoints that we are going to uh, use in our assessments, whatever they may be. Um, is it going to be the, the phthalate syndrome, um, or are we going to be more inclusive than that? I'd like to open up that discussion at this point. Any comments? Do we agree that the um, the majority of the data, at least from the animal studies, is going to be phthalate syndrome? Maybe human data, we have more variety of endpoints. It seems like the phthalate syndrome would be the default <clears throat> because it is the one that seems to appear at the lowest dose level, the one that has consistency across phthalates, doesn't have consistency across species, but there are so many studies now that have explored this in rats that, that it has that internal consistency that it's been repeated. So I, th I think with those, and there are parts of the syndrome that resemble the situation in humans and in, in terms of endpoints. So I think it would be hard to come up with other endpoints that uh, have characteristics, a pattern like that that would drive us to another one. But maybe we could, if we think about the phthalate syndrome as maybe the, the place where you put a initial focus and then come back and ask, if we had chosen, is there any evidence that other endpoints could have been affected at lower levels than what we might find? Phthalate syndrome. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think the animal data and, and the phthalate syndrome is where most of the data is and most sensitive. In, in humans, of course, you know, there's other endpoints, neurodevelopment, um, growth, body composition, but there's, there's not much uh, comparison data in the animals, so. And then on the other side, there's not a lot of human data on the testicular dysgenesis syndrome. I mean, apart from Shauna Swan's AGD paper, there's not a lot or nothing. So then do I understand from that that going down to our second question that we're going to focus, not restrict, but focus our attention on uh, prenatal exposures? Burn. It, it raises a question that Paul talked about a little bit, and I, <clears throat> it's prenatal in the rat, but what is the time of exposure in the human that corresponds ontologically to that prenatal period in the rat? I think Paul had, had mentioned he didn't specifically give um, definitive answer, but I think he said from about eight weeks to 15 weeks or so, so, or even maybe as early as six weeks. But I, I think we need to have that footmark in there that, that that time isn't the same in rats as it is in humans, but what we're focusing on is when the time of exposure during that ontological period is what we are really concerned about. Correct. So that's Ogre? Plus, there might be more than one testosterone-modulated windows of susceptibility in the human, even after birth. Well, that's, that's the question I want us to discuss. So, do so we are pretty confident to compare the, air, the, the, the gestational day 16 to 17 in the red with the end of the first trimester in humans, but we have other windows of susceptibility. 
possibly in the human, pre and post birth. Uh, mini puberty at three to six months, and then of course exactly. pubertal development. Um, but at least from the the rat data, they suggest that the fetal window is more sensitive, even though they do see effects during pubertal exposure. So maybe comparable in humans. There's a recent new experimental evidence from Richard Sharp's lab to show that continuation of exposures in the neonatal period will make sure that the effects persist. So that is quite important as well, I think. Burn? Is there data in rodents, in rats? Okay, so we're, we're, we're going to expand the time frame of our consideration to the neonatal period as well? How is it with human puberty? Is it regulated by testosterone? Of course. Yes, in boys. So yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> And the other, I mean, when you think about life stages, the other part of it is the exposures. Obviously, the neonatal exposure pathways are going to be different than the, the um, you know, infants and toddlers and so on. Well, my hearing then that we're going to go all the way through the uterine period of, of exposure for our consideration, okay? So where does that take us in terms of time frame, human development? From eight weeks prenatal to... For puberty? Mm-hmm. And is it complete in the yes. male? Probably you would say... Uh, well, definitely by 17, 18, but generally you know, 16, 17. Okay. I mean, it, it varies, of course. But. Yeah, yeah, by about the time you can call, be called into the army in the U.S., but still not allowed to have a drink of beer. <laughs> Earl, Earl suggested that the brain doesn't mature till much later, but yeah, that's another issue. I think Earl should speak for himself. <laughs> okay, um, I was just looking at our, our list of critical issues, and I think we've, <laughs> we've discussed the third one, which phthalates are essential. We've, we've Discuss that. Haven't come to a conclusion yet. We're going to determine that. Um, and then the issue about um, Philip, Philip. building on the. Philip. Yes, I think we should stick with this point. With point three. Because. Okay. If we take the long and winding road through a cumulative risk assessment, we need common endpoints. So I think we should discuss on which of the phthalates or substitution products we focus and if we have the needed information on the respective endpoints. But I thought Mike was going to get that together for us. I missed that. Well, I'm, I'm certainly going to try to get more information about the, the uses and potential exposures of that long list of phthalates. I think we should keep it a bit pragmatic here. We we can elaborate the list, yeah. but I think for a good starting point, we should just throw these the lates and substitution products in the round, and in a couple of minutes discuss if we have the relevant endpoints and data on these endpoints present. Okay, let's. Why don't you start? <laughs> yeah. So I think for for most of the phthalates in question, we have the relevant data, but. If my recollection is correct, 
for some of the substitution products, we don't have the relevant data. So I would say that the relevant endpoint is the phthalate syndrome, mm -hmm. with the most sensitive uh, parameter being the testicular testosterone level and the HED, for example. So my question now is, do we have this data, exam for example, for the DPHP? Do we have it for DINCH? Well, we uh, for in Earl's talk yesterday, for the uh, his assay uh, on uh, testosterone uh, production, Vivo, he had uh, one experiment on DINCH, which was negative, uh, kind of a screening. Mm -hmm. um, DPHP was on his list, but has not been done yet, as well as DIDP, which is, of course, one of the interim band ones. He hasn't gotten to that either. Um, and I think that would be very useful information. <clears throat> as far as the range of substitutes, you know, we have, among other things, uh, we have the Versar report, which li lists potential substitutes, and we also have our own uh, report where we measured what was actually in the toys uh, about a year ago and you know there were five or whatever five or so very common ones probably dinch uh, in you know the usual the ones you would expect citrates and adipates and so on DEHT was common of those I know DEHT pretty sure was negative in, in uh, at least Paul Fost Foster's experiments from the last century. Um, uh, some of the others, uh, you know, DEHA, maybe they should be, maybe, you know, maybe we can suggest to Earl and Paul that they look at some of the other citrates, because I'm not so sure if we have the, those data. Yesterday, when we discussed this, Earl pointed out, Earl Gray pointed out that Dinch he tested, um, but it was a screening experiment with, I think, three dams were dosed. And he, um, he admitted that had he, he, he said he cannot exclude to have probably seen an effect had he done a dose escalation study. So it is pleasing to hear from him that there was no observable effect, but he himself was not absolutely sh certain that uh, with a dose escalation such an effect would not appear. From the robust summary which we have in front of us from BASF concerning hexamol dinge, um, I think what we can glean here is that in the study according to OCD test guidelines which they carried out, they used a far high powered experiment, 25 dams or something. But I cannot uh, uh, detect from that robust summary whether or not there are the relevant data to us, relevant data yeah. gathered, whether yeah. uh, reduction in testosterone was measured, I assume it wasn't. So I conclude that concerning DINCH, the relevant data are not available really to mm -hmm. us, either to us or not available at all. Yeah, I mean the actual studies um, are not available right now and that's, a, that's an issue, that's an important issue. What other, uh, either phthalate or, or alternative, should you wish to discuss? DHP, probably. What do we know about that? Uh, well, I I suggested to uh, Earl and Paul that they sit, test DPHP because it's. 3 propyl heptyl it has you know the branching uh, not uh, similar to DEHP so 
I definitely wanted that tested, and even though it's it's not, I don't think it's being used in toys yet. Um, um, and BASF says they wouldn't necessarily recommend it for that use, but still, it's such an obvious, uh, to me, it's an obvious potential substitute. Someone's probably going to use it, so that was high on my list uh, to nominate for them. But again, that's in the same category. There are data that we don't have access to the original studies. So industry data we don't have. Right. I think Andreas's point is that when we have such data, instead of just having at a screening level, if we could have more right, right, robust right. studies with 25 dams in a group or whatever, I mean, the, whatever the standard is. Right, and um, that's, of course, um, we can't do it or tell them to do it. We could ask them to do it. Uh, we could nominate it to NTP or, or, you know, we can try to get it done. That I, I think that comes under the number five. Uh, are there any critical studies? Uh, we can certainly ask for them. So, uh, you know, is it reasonable it, with the lack of data to make conservative assumptions about the potential risk for such chemicals where we don't have data and? Yeah, I'm not, sure we, can. I'm not sure we, we can. I'm not sure we can. I'm not sure we can. Yeah. I guess that's a question of judgment. Precautionary principle. I mean, it, it, it's one of those, you know, one of the potential steps is to, uh, we do have reviews of these chemicals and to just quickly go through and say, what do they have and is that going to be adequate? Or, or not. But lack of information doesn't mean safety. No, and no. So I think we need to be careful well, about. We need to be. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it, we can say you know maybe we can't evaluate it. That doesn't make it safe, um, or you know prove that there's no hazard or no risk, and we need to be clear about that. But Mike, you don't, the, the CPSC does not have the regulatory authority to ask for certain kinds of data on any new product coming in. Well, we can't, that's absolutely right. We don't have the authority to, well, we can't demand that it be done. Our options are to nominate it to NTP, well, ask the company, nominate to NTP, or work through the uh, EPA's interagency testing committee and see if they can uh, get the companies to do it. Um, I mean, those are our options. We can't uh, demand that someone do it, and we can't, uh, we don't have the, the labs anymore to, to do it ourselves. Okay, any other alternatives we want to discuss? Apart from the alternatives, we, although the animal data is not indicative, we might have to evaluate methyl and ethyl phthalate also because of the, of the, well, suggestive human data. For definitely for ethyl, yeah. the diethyl phthalate. Oh, you mean what are the endpoints? No, what for? is it used what is it used for? Why are you saying for human? Oh, because there's human data showing associations between monoethyl phthalate and acid. It's used in personal care products, okay. but yeah. So that would be a phthalate we'd want to add to our list, not an alternative. Yeah. So D E P. So we're D E H P, B B P and and uh, DBP are uh, the ones that are, quote, banned. We'll look at those. DINP, DP, DNOP, the interim, we'll look at DEP. The IBP, isobutyl phthalate. Any others? 
for the decal and the um, octo, there's not a lot of animal data, I don't think. But. 10, well, yeah. But for the matter of completeness, uh, the, 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 we should include this one too. And also the P7, and from prop of delays. The linears. Yeah. I wish we had Earl's slide. I, know, I remember the slide that he had, the list of all of the chemicals that he yeah. looked at. I don't, I don't remember what was on that and what was on which. Um, do, we, do we think that all of the chemicals we've listed are on that page, whether or not they've been evaluated? Um, Probably, well. The, yeah, for the phthalates. A lot of, the high, a lot of them. And, and have we asked him if we can have the data? Uh, not yet, but we'll. And I think the date, the underlying data on those slides, I think, are published. It's just that I was having trouble tracking it all down and recreating. So we'll we'll get what we can from him. Um, Well, the, the new stuff, the, the, they're doing the, this, the new results where they're doing the testosterone production, that's, uh, that's not published, I don't think. But we'll we have this, at least have the slides. We'll make sure whatever they do publish, we'll make sure we get it. We're on their list of uh, to get copies of it when it is published or get an alert. Any other nominations to our universe of? Well, I just wanted to to clarify the DEP. It's a sol essentially a solvent, and it's not going to be in, in the toys. It's probably not going to be in the what we call child care products, although, right. unless, although it, the cosmetic child care products it could be in. But the, it's, it's a different exposure yeah. source. Yeah. But, but potentially a, a high mm -hmm. exposure. Mm -hmm. Well, it, falls it is under, a high exposure. It falls under Roman three, which we... Examine likely exposure of children, pregnant women. Pregnant women are very likely to expose to, oh, to yeah. be exposed. Absolutely, yes. yeah. <clears throat> no further comments, nominations. Well, numbers, yeah. Point number four, I don't know whether we need to discuss that any further. Um, yeah. I think we agree that we're not going to plow new ground within the, <laughs> ignore what's been summarized very nicely in, in the NRC documents. But is there any, any comment? And then number five, uh, we, we've, we've touched on, I'm not sure we've, we've um, yeah. expressed definitively that we want something done, but are there, are there critical gaps, essentially, that, that some study, given the lifetime of this committee, could be done that would help us in our achieving our charge. Burn. Well, I, 
I'm sure there are critical gaps. I think what was on my mind when we talked about this earlier was the possibility that there are some gaps that if we proceeded without information, we would regret it, as opposed to just nice to have additional information. And it doesn't seem like we have identified gaps that if we don't fill them before we proceed, we will be uh, remiss. So it, it isn't clear that there are studies that would keep us from proceeding uh, that would have to be done. If you nominate for studies to the NTP, it'll be a couple of years before you see the results. If we ask industry, it'll take time. If you nominate to the NTP, it prompts industry to do their own studies. And you, <clears throat> I don't remember what other alternatives you have for filling data gaps. Um, but we can go to Earl or to yeah. others. Yeah, that might be the quickest. Yeah. But th there isn't any one of these that would generate information before the next or even the subsequent meeting to be of that much help to us. I can't envision studies being done before we're done. Certainly true for for human studies. As well, N sure. Unlikely that anything is going to become available in the time frame that we have. Well, I think Shauna said she'd have some some data, not so much on the phthalates, but I think the AGD in relation to other endpoints. Yes. So. Well, one thing, you know, we tried to do yesterday is find out what's almost done. And I, I think we've uh, discussed six quite substantially this morning. And I don't. We can we can look at seven and, and talk about that. Um, we may not do a cumulative risk assessment, which makes if that's the case that makes this one mute. But I, I think the concept of, of are we going to include other antiandrogens in our evaluation should be di discussed. Well, again, I think the distinction is quantitative cumulative risk assessment or in terms of, uh, you know, you can consider whether or not co-exposure to certain substances will, for example, shift those responses for phthalates. And I think we can, uh, on the basis of uh, evidence presented to us yesterday by Earl Grey, we, there are some chemicals where we can make such statements, albeit not. In a, in, a, in a quantifying way, I think that's premature, but in my mind, um, what is asked of us explicitly in the charge uh, would mean that we have to consider such, such factors. I mean, what I didn't get from yesterday was a sense of, uh, you know, this is one that we're all exposed to and you have to include this. Um, I think uh, I haven't uh, I, or I keep asking people, what are the ones that are, uh, you know, uh, where there's lots of exposure, universal exposure, that have to be included in this? And uh, I haven't gotten an, uh, an answer yet. Well, I, I thought Earl Gray pointed out TCDD. Okay, yeah, yeah, well, that's definitely universal. And, and DDE? Para para DDE, oh, okay. metabolite of DDT, yeah. which was shown to be anti-androgenic, Kelch. Uh. There's also a question mark concerning certain uh, anti-androgenic pesticides, um, but I don't know what the situation is here in the U.S., but uh, in Europe, you would definitely say, yeah, there's, there's exposure to those as well but we would know which chemicals to look at there. One pesticide would be vinclosolin, but we, at least in the US, do not have biomonitoring data regarding this pesticide. There's no data in enhance. We know there's exposure to 
vinclosolin or its metabolites in Europe after consuming certain types of red wine. Yeah, the, the all azole pesticides basically are need to be looked at. Whether that's possible in a quantitative way, whether the data are there here for the US is a second matter, but um, probably that will be one thing that will more or less be self-limiting. But they, they might be um, more like a, a qualitative exercise. I mean, go, going back to number six, I thought from Earl Slides uh, that there is hope for having, you know, common endpoints and common dose response shapes and so on. So that might not be so bad. Uh, it, I suppose it may be a problem if you include other th uh, pesticides and other uh, non-phthalate compounds. Uh, it might be an issue for dealing with diethyl, but as far as the phthalate syndrome goes, um, well, the animal data, it, it, it looks pretty good. Down a little. I think we've, we've talked about eight. That kind of corresponds to the populations. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I guess, but we could consider, uh, well, what are the sources of ex exposure? I, we, we've talked a lot about that. I don't think we're overlooking a lot of uh, any major sources. I mean, I'll try to see what I can find out about the pesticides, but um, I don't think we're we're missing too much. Yeah, other than the from food. So. Yeah, I mean, well, we're aware. I think we're aware, aware of, of it, the major sources. Yeah. Uh, whether we have the data, um, right? Because we don't. I mean, even if we had data on levels in foods in the U.S., it would still be uh, uh, a very difficult task to estimate exposures. Holger, I think a point that has to make, be made clear is also what is the distribution of the exposures we are interested in. Are we interested in median exposures? Are we interested in the 95th percentile of exposures? Are we interested in the 99th percentile? Or in maximum values? This is a question of importance for interpreting the biomonitoring data, but also of interest for interpreting the model data from mouthing experiments and so on. I'm pointing that out because on Monday most of the data presented by certain presenters had been focused on median exposures. And I think this does not help us at all. I mean, it's, and it's, you know, it's one thing to have uh, percentile exposures to the individual phthalates, but how do you combine that? The person who's in the 95th percentile for DINP may be in the fifth percentile for something else. I think that's pretty simple. We have the individual data on enhance. We know what person A has its exposure, his or her exposure to phthalate A, phthalate B, phthalate C. And the question is, do we want to stick to the conservative approach and add the exposure of each individual? Or do we kind of want to make a certain worst case projection and adding up the 95th percentiles for each value and this would uh, assume that uh, in the worst case approach there might be individuals taking up 
all of the phthalates in the higher percentiles. So in the, I think uh, in the um, migration approach, you do use this worst case, uh, case assumption. So in my, in my feeling, there is no argument against doing this also in the biomonitoring data. But I think this is a point we might discuss. I think that that, I mean, that would be a very conservative approach. Um, there probably are statistical methods to estimate 99th percentile of a multidimensional uh, set of chemicals. Uh, I don't think that's a simple task. Uh, I can certainly look into that, but I, I you know, because it depends on, it's going to depend on what else is there. You can say you're on the mm -hmm. boundary of some cloud, but in which direction? I mean, we could try to investigate that a little further and see. If you're still on that percentile, you know, what's the worst case of that percentile in terms of risk or something? It would be helpful if you could think about that and include that in your contribution. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, it's, it's fine to be conservative and, you know, add the 95th percentiles, especially as a first cut. Um, but if you do that and then you say the risk is too high, then the question is, do you want to refine that? Um, also, in if you do with the individual data, I mean, do you w would you weight the different phthalates differently mm -hmm. uh, uh, due to potency differences, or mm -hmm. or how would you do that? My recollection is there are no potency differences, except maybe D, I, and P. I mean, the others are are pretty close enough. But, okay, I'm just wondering about that. But I would agree with Holger, you know, in terms of using the 95th percentile for multiple phthalates, because, you know, it's not unreasonable. You know, maybe in the end, Haynes, it's whatever, 1,500 people, but, which sounds like a lot, but it's not unreasonable to think that people will have multiple exposures to these phthalates because they're from different sources, and one doesn't preclude the other, so you could potentially have an exposure to DEHP, dibutyl phthalate, et cetera, that are in the upper range. And then there's, of course, the special circumstances where, you know, you have, um, whether it's from medications, medical devices, et cetera, you can have exposures that are 100 or 1,000 times higher. Any other comments? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it sounded to me yesterday like the distinction between EPA and FDA is fairly clear and may be a topic of ongoing discussion as time as needed, but that the distinction between the, the regulatory realm for EPA and CPSC isn't as well defined. Is that true? Well, in, in the sense, I mean, EPA ha has, what, five different activities going on right now involving phthalates, so de they're definitely um, active, that's for certain. And uh, there is uh, 
significant overlap between our purview and, and, and TOSCA, the OPPT. And, you know, we're, we're used to working with them. I mean, not that we don't work with FDA, but we're certainly um, probably work with OPPT more than, than a lot of other agencies. I guess what I was looking for rather than activity <clears throat> was just the question if you have consumers who become alarmed because of an exposure and perhaps a response and they say what who regulates this yeah. who do I go to do they end up hearing from EPA no we don't do that CPSC does and CPSC says no we don't that's EPA's that are there gaps of that um, kind? I think usually uh, it, it's more of an overlap than a gap But in terms of exposure, I mean, I, I don't know that I have a strong sense this actually happens, but, you know, if the EPA ended up doing regulatory, making regulatory decisions based on exposure only to pesticides, but then we knew there was exposure. I mean, you know, well, the e science needs to be yeah. whole and not. Well, e EPA and F I mean, FDA are, are almost like five different agents, you know, um, and, of course, we really are a different agency, and that makes it hard to do things like this. But we are, you know, we're looking for ways to work together. Someone suggested that exposure because it, it is the thing to do because we have no one started that yet. Um, um, you know, and there is a potential with the uh, IRIS activity and their workshop coming up. There's a, a potential that we can if not work together, at least uh, share information and make our jobs, rel uh, respective jobs easier. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's not unprecedented for, to have an interagency activity. Well, it, we did it a long time ago for dioxin, where uh, FDA, the different parts of FDA and EPA and CPSC contributed to a they, then it was a multimedia risk assessment was the term that they used. Um, and then we've collaborated on other activities um, as well. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's a possibility. The trick is to line up our, uh, not just our, you know, program needs, but also the timing. Okay, hey, um, it's close to the noon break for lunch. Uh, given that we're going to lose two of the members of the committee uh, before we reconvene, uh, do is there any other business that the rest of us want to discuss between the end of lunch and, and 2 p.m. when the rest of us have to leave, or should we uh, adjourn the meeting at this point? Can, can I, um, if, if, if we decide to adjourn, um, trying to think, it, are, there, if, are there any little business things? Um, the, uh, the books have two CDs. Everyone should have two CDs. One that I prepared that's essentially what's in the book, but plus a few extras that were too big to put in the book. Uh, the other CD is is from Exxon Mobil, mm -hmm. and that has uh, not only their presentations, but there's a lot of data in there. In fact, there is a database in there that um, Dr. Clark talked about yesterday uh, when she was talking about exposure. Um, there's a, a whole database in there, so um, uh, I think. Uh, there, there's a lot of information, published papers, um, unpublished reports, and so on. Um, uh, anyway, there's a lot of, uh, you should have two of those, at least when you leave. We could, if you're on an airplane, we can mail you the, the book itself if you like, but um, you might want to take those CDs. I also have some hard copies of some of the, of Dr. Godwin's slides from yesterday. 
that you are can take with you if you like we, because we didn't have people. have them in advance yeah and Mike you'll make sure that we get uh, information from the presenters that I'll make sure I'll track them down and get everything um, I will also I'll go through my notes in in la la as I did last time um, summarize any to do list of to do things um, oh, do we want to make a, a a date firm when we will each of us on the committee have our whatever it is we put together uh, oh, yeah. do to the committee we're going to meet presumably in December can, can we not uh, can we not make the date firm the um, dates we agreed on and assume that it's going to go ahead then and until we hear otherwise when well, the, the, the meeting date I think is firm is firm yeah uh, a date for submitting uh, all of your search uh, distributing all of your thoughts on how to proceed oh, I see. Yes. we want to yes. do that uh, we, a we month want before the meeting or yeah. we want Andreas's cumulative risk assessment <laughs> yeah to us yeah. A, a, a draft will be okay yeah a draft is fine um, no more than a hundred pages okay. yeah and um, you know two or three significant digits will suffice um, but do we want to get those uh, things a month before month and two months before and then talk about them a month before a month would so do the first week in November when uh, it, do, should we pick a date for a conference call which I'm not sure we I guess we'd have to do it late in the day here or early early in the morning US time oh yeah yeah I I got it backwards which means it's really early. really early <laughs> <laughs> on the West Coast. <laughs> the hardest we, uh, we had one where we had Europe, Canada, Australia. And I don't know if we had Japan, but I mean it was it was kind of difficult. So five a.m. Portland time is nine hours difference from. Germany, I think. Yeah. We are in the graveyard hour after lunch then. Yeah. Well, five my time would be four your time in the afternoon. But if we say work backwards, uh, four o'clock Germany. No, five o'clock in Germany is four o'clock in Britain. And that is nine o'clock here and Six o'clock. Is that? Is this okay for you? Is this okay for you? I don't want to. As long as I have my, as time. long as I have my coffee. I'm fine. Well, and, and the question is, would would uh, you two rather do it at the end of the day from work or at night from home? I mean, it's an option. Um, end of end of day from work would yeah. be fine. Yeah. We don't necessarily stop at five at yeah. British universities. Okay. So Good. six o'clock. But they are in the pub at that point. Yeah. Well, that, there's that's that two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll be, or is it seven a? That would be seven a.m. on the east coast. Nine, nine a.m. East Coast. Oh, nine a.m. East Coast, six West Coast, four p.m. Right, how many hours between New York and London? Five. Oh, we can do it. We can do it at five or six p.m. German time. Yeah, yeah. So really, that's okay. I mean, is is 
German and Germany an hour behind yeah. or ahead. Oh, we are ahead. We are ahead of, 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 of Andreas. No, Germany is always ahead in terms of time. <laughs> <laughs> so Britain is an hour behind yeah. Germany. So, so when it's five o'clock in Germany, it's four o'clock in Britain. So let's make it six o'clock German time, five o'clock yep. London time. So that would be Noon. ten o'clock. Noon. Noon in New York, or New York and Locked after in. breakfast in. That, it, that, that works for me. I, I can get, usually get B to work by noon. <laughs> so did we choose a day? Oh, uh, not a day yet, but we were. Mike. Uh, yeah. uh, well, if we have the, if we get the stuff uh, by November 1st, when would you like to, how long do you need, do you want to read it? Uh, a week? A week to digest. Yeah. I'm doing an NIH review the 8th and 9th of November, so if we could do it after that. About, about Friday the 12th. Not good for you. Okay. Well, I'm, Friday's not good, period? Australia? I, I may be in Portland. Look me up if you are. Okay. Looking at the week of uh, November 8th. 15. How's the 18th? 18th of November? Not yeah. teaching that day, so I can do that. Bulger, is that good for you? 18th of November? Not good. Fifteenth or sixteenth? Sixteen. Is fifteenth so, good with you? That's the day I teach, but that's okay. I can do that. But not, don't teach until the afternoon. So. Oh, okay. so the 15th then? 15th of November work for everyone? Monday the 15th. Over? Yep. Yep, that's fine. Okay, that's it. I think it's November. 12 o'clock East Coast, right? November 15th. Other business, Mike. Um, I think that's it. Uh, some of them, a couple, a couple of you need to see Lisa before you go. Okay. If, if you so that's Monday, November fifteenth mm -hmm. at six p.m. Germany or 5 p.m. England or 5 p.m. is that uh, Greenwich Mean Time? Greenwich Mean Time, yeah. GMT. Yeah. And it's Okay. The second meeting of the chap is adjourned. This is a bad summer. Well, she said she moved it.